Hey legend, in today's episode, we are talking to Kyle McDowell. He started off working in tiny little cubicles and worked his way up to lead some of the largest companies in the world. We're talking Fortune 10 companies, not Fortune 100 or Fortune 500. We're talking, he's helping to lead teams of over 15,000 people. This episode is for you if you wanna learn how to communicate with your team to get them to perform better, and also how to communicate with the people above you so that you can create a really great work environment that helps everyone thrive and everyone enjoy the work that they're doing. You can tell by the way that Kyle speaks and presents himself that he just gets people. I took a lot away from this episode. I wrote a lot of notes and I know you're absolutely gonna enjoy it. So hope you have some fun. Enjoy this episode with Kyle McDowell. Okay, rock and roll. Welcome, Kyle. Man, really enjoyed our conversation before we got started. Good to have you here. Yeah, hey man, it's great to be here and kind of unfortunate we weren't rolling already because uh, I, I as well, I enjoyed it. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. Thanks for having me, man. Yeah, man, we're kicking off with some good stuff today, I think. Yeah, we were talking and you wrote like the book sales, even though the book's been out for a while, they've tripled in the last couple of months and things have just been really cranking. People are hassling you for speaking gigs. What do you think has caused this pickup? Yeah, you're right. So um, we just passed, I guess it's been about 14, 15 months now that the book has been out. And, you know, I guess like anything else, you know, it started just kind of a trickle and, and to be honest with you, Josh, it started as a as a passion project. I, I wrote the book, just needed to kind of be, it was almost cathartic to get so many experiences from my my corporate life in writing, kind of get it out of me. Um, but what I think is driving the sales as of late, the last few months is there's this kind of momentum that I'm feeling. It's really hard to describe or quantify. I've I've I'm at a place now where I'm doing more speeches. I'm on stage more than I've ever been, and um, that connected to the increase in book sales tells me, and it's kind of a double-edged sword, but it tells me that there's a real need for my message. There's a real need for folks to understand the value and the fulfillment impact that comes when you live a principle-based life. And when you lead uh, with principles, that's kind of like your foundational uh, paradigm. Um, so I, I can't quite explain why now, but it certainly feels like with all the noise in all of our lives, uh, there is, even if it's kind of muted and people don't talk about it, there's a hunger for people to live a more impactful life. But unfortunately, a lot of our paths, especially our work lives, kind of sucks that out of us and it pulls it away. And we end up just kind of drifting from the next role to the next role to the next role without really having an impact. Um, so I, I think I think it's a moment in time that is really that is really kind of um, at a crossroads of how well we lean into each other, help each other, pick each other up, you know, live a principle-based life. The double-edged sword of that is, the double, the other side of that is, it's unfortunate that what I do for a living is needed. Um, because if you're a good human, you take care of those around you, you lift other people up, you, you aim to make others around you better than they were yesterday. Uh, that should be a fundamental requirement of, of being a human on this planet in my mind. And it just, for whatever reason or any variety of reasons, it's just not like that in a lot of environments. Yeah, totally. Where did you learn to live a principle-based life? Where did, where did that come from? Um, it started in my work life, in my professional life. And I would love to tell you it's something that's anchored me throughout my career, but that's just not true. So uh, for some context, I spent nearly 30 years in big corporate America. And my last couple of roles, I led collectively more than 30,000 employees in nearly every state in the country. Had some international operations as well. Um, and after about 25 of those years, I was done. I had had it, um, became very apathetic to the whole system. Just felt like the bureaucracy that I had witnessed, the, uh, duplicity, the way people treated one another, you know, you know, for someone to win, someone else must lose type mentality, which is garbage. I just had enough. And I told myself when I left, uh, the firm I was with back in, I guess it was about 2016, I, I decided I was going to leave this company to pursue another opportunity that had come my way. And, and, and I told myself if I took that role that I was going to lead in a way that I had never led before, because I'd lost all the optimism and passion and I didn't feel like I was making an impact. And I'm like, well, what am I doing? You know, why am I, why am I working, you know, 2,500 hours a year? Why am I working? 10, 12 hours a day, I'm on the road three out of four weeks. Why am I doing this if I'm not leaving a legacy, if I'm not having an impact? Um, well, be careful what you wish for, because I got a job that said, you know what, we've got a big toxic, uh, kind of a toxic environment we're trying to work through. We've got some really tenured leaders that probably need a shot in the arm. Um, it's yours. 
So I, I took the role and, and the night before I was to meet with the top 40 or 50 leaders of that, of that organization of my now newly inherited organization, dude, I was in my hotel room and I had no idea what I was going to say the night before I was, I was borderline terrified, but I just knew I had to do something different because we had all, you know, in big corporate America. So many of us have seen the same play, the same movie roll out and play out over and over and over and over again. You know, it's this backstabbing garbage that we've all seen. So I, I just knew I had to do something different. So I created these principles the night before. They had 10, 10 sentences. Each began with the word we. I'm not super creative, Josh, so I now have the 10 we's. So the next morning, I stepped in front of that group of leaders and, and said, guys, uh, most importantly, these are the, the rules of the road. These are the principles by which we will operate internally every single day. I want to hold you accountable to these, and I'm going to do that. But, mo but more important than that, you should know, I expect you to hold me accountable as well, right? What leader says that? No one talks how, how openly about having a level playing field in terms of accountability. There's always this leadership gap, but the leader's allowed to do something, but the team is not. And I knew that would not work because they had seen that. Um, and, and so fast forward several years later, those principles are still the cultural manifesto of that organization. And what, what happened, and I'm circling back to your question now, what happened for me was I found myself behaving in accordance with these 10 we's, these principles um, every day, all day, but not necessarily as much when I left work, not as much on the weekends, not as much with my friends and family. And if I am someone who puts so much emphasis and pride around authenticity, I found myself feeling like a hypocrite uh, because I truly believe if you're going to behave one way inside the workplace, you need to try to be consistent in all avenues, right? Whether it's work, home, friends, family, whatever. Now, I'm not naive, man. We can't say certain things and there are topics that might be, I'm not, right? I'm not naive to that. But if I'm going to say inside the workplace that we do the right thing always, what kind of hypocrite leaves the workplace, leaves the professional life, goes and behaves in a way that is not consistent with what they are evangelizing and preaching? In the workplace, it just felt very double standard, hypocritical to me. So over time, and it wasn't a light switch. So over time, as I found myself evangelizing these principles in the workplace, going on stage um, and, and really trying to inspire people to live this and lead this way, um, I just felt like a hypocrite. And, and there was a, a gradual shift to that. Those principles now, they are my principles 24-7, 365. I'm not perfect at it by any means, but it is my, they are my North Star. Um, which is why I think it's important for folks to take their work lives seriously, but also don't allow that work life to be a complete disconnection from who you are every single day, because that's not, you're not going to bring your best self to the table when you do that. Was there a breakthrough moment with that team where you think that they, maybe it was in that moment or it was later on down the road where, you know, cause you're coming into this fresh, right? They don't know you, you're, you're breaking through and having to build trust with them and that this is the right way to go and that you actually mean what you say. When you say, hey, guys, authenticity across the board or, you know, challenge across the board, was there a moment where that actually happened and you feel like it got embedded into that culture? I don't think I don't think there was a sentinel moment. Um, it was a it was a I think a gradual adoption of the principles. Now, if you were to meet with any one of my direct reports from that time period, they would they would acknowledge and admit that for the first year or so. I wasn't convinced that my team was was actually embracing the principles more than they were just kind of kissing up to the new boss. I, that, right. Because when you have some fancy title and a bunch of direct reports, this huge organization, your jokes are always funnier. Somehow people find ways to talk to you like they're they're always interested in what you have to say. And, and, and I'm not naive to the fact that that's not entirely genuine, depending on the person. So it took me a long, long time to realize that they were really resonating. And I'll tell you a really quick story that I think I'm really proud of, but I think it kind of uh, personifies the answer to the question. So when I first rolled the principles out, man, of that 40 or 50 people in the audience, I would say half was really optimistic. They were excited. They're like, this is a new way of living and, and leading. And this guy's really in it for us. And there was a quarter of the audience that was, I would say skeptical, but open-minded. And the last quarter was just downright, this guy's full of shit. Like they, they, I could just see it on their faces, right? So much so that one of the guys in the audience, uh, who I tell a story about in the book, his name is Nick. That evening, we were at a dinner with all the, the, the folks, might've been a day later, but he says, Kyle, uh, I have to admit something to you. I 
had to Google the 10 we's because I thought you had plagiarized them and we're going to kind of market them as your own. I said, no, Nick, that's, you know, I created them. And then a light bulb went off. He had earlier in the day asked for the actual presentation. He asked for the PowerPoint file. And I thought that was interesting, but okay, sure. Of course you can have it. And he admitted that he wanted to check the properties of the file to see if I was indeed the person who created the file that I had just walked them through. So there was, th there was this kind of skepticism out of Nick and a few others, but the story, the, the one that really highlights the best example, I think is there was a woman who was, she wasn't overt and outspoken in saying she thought I was full of it, but her behavior said so. My favorite example of, and her name's Julia, she knows I tell this story. Um, I asked her for an Excel workbook. I said, I need to take a look at this data for whatever problem we were trying to solve. I forget the issue. And she sent me a screenshot. And for any of your audience that understands the value of a screenshot of Excel is about as valuable as a piece of paper with a few numbers written on it. Like it's not helpful. I said, come on, Julia, let me, can I get the workbook, please? No pushback. She sends me a tab, not the whole workbook. So now I've gotten a little bit more, but not exactly what I asked for. And then we had some, some difficult words. And, um, but I knew if one of my, one of my principles that I just rolled out to the team is we embrace challenge. If I reacted in a classic boss format, banging my fist on the desk, you know, give me the damn PowerPoint. If I would have behaved that way, I'm not living the principles. I've encouraged them to call me out on it. My whole arrival in this principle stuff is DOA because I'm at that point a hypocrite. So I had to swallow it. I had to swallow that frustration. And there was a lot. Um, but here's the, the, the parenthetical piece. I have not worked with this woman in four years. We still have one-on-ones every four or six weeks. Uh, I consider her one of my closest professional colleagues, if not downright friend. Um, so we went from, and I think that was built out of her skepticism. She probably thought that I was full of it. We both acknowledged we did not see eye to eye. It was water and oil to begin with. But now she has a tremendous amount of respect for me. And that's only eclipsed probably by my respect for her. So it was a gradual process that I, I started to see people. But, but had I behaved in a way that was contrary to any one of those principles, we, we'd be having a different conversation. Um, so you have to, you can't just talk it. You got to prove it. And as a leader, your teams are watching every single day to see if you prove it. Yeah. In that example, like it feels like you would have been pretty justified to be like, God damn it. Just give me the goddamn Excel's preach. Like, you know, you know, and, and kind of jumping down her throat a little bit and putting her in line, you know, to use a, you know, some common word, like, what do you think would have happened if you had done that? And in that moment, you probably would have felt pretty justified. Like, what do you think, how do you think that relationship would have gone? Absolutely would have felt just, and I wanted to, like, I, I don't, I wouldn't want you or anyone in your audience to think just because I'm, I, I live and lead a very, very principled life that I don't have challenges adhering to my own principles because I'm not perfect at it. I wanted to bang my fist on the desk. I wanted to be a jerk to her. Um, but it was, you know, it was one of those, it was one of those moments that something and I don't mean to sound too woo woo, but something just told me like, dude, if you really want to have the impact that you think you can have, you have to prove this and you're going to be challenged every single day because I was new to the organization. These principles were new to me. So they were obviously new to the organization as well. I just knew I had to, I had to toe the line of who we were, who I wanted us to be. And I wanted us to be a group that embraced challenge, you know, whether it's external, whether it's internal, um, challenges are part of life and, and getting better and, 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 and being someone who you can be proud of your efforts, whether the success is there or not, but you really put in an honest day's work is, is something I wanted us to be known for. And, and I do think that's missing in a lot of team environments, right? What are we known for? How do we want to be perceived externally? How do we want others in our, in our company to perceive what we do? Um, you know, I wanted us to build what I now coin and refer to a lot as a leadership legacy. I wanted us to be different. And, um, I still have stayed, as I mentioned, stayed in touch with a lot of people in that organization, some, not as many as others. And it's humbling the feedback. I still get so many years later, which is, which is, is, as I say, it's, it's humbling. It's very, very cool. It is really cool. How, how do you manage yourself in that moment? Like when you have that want to slam you, you know, you feel justified or whatever. Cause sometimes I, f I find that's tough. You know, is there something that you say to yourself or do you have a ledge or a bridge that you do to kind of keep yourself present and not react? The short answer is no, I don't, I don't have anything that I could, that any sexy kind of go to when I'm, 
when I'm facing adversity. But what I have managed to do, and I'm, I've got a lot of work to do on this, admittedly, and I'd love to hear, I'd love to hear your response to your own question, to be honest. But I, um, we have this moment between stimulus and response, right? When she says, here's your screenshot, I have a moment in time in which I can allow that to go half a second. I can allow it to go a minute. I can allow it to go as long as I want. Rarely do we give ourselves that space to reply or respond or react in a way that we'd be proud of an hour or days or months later. Um, so I feel like I've, that's, that is something I've focused on. I don't have any great techniques to share. It's just when something happens, um, and I've seen, you're probably aware of Jocko, right? Jocko Willenick, he talks about this. When something shitty is thrown my way, he says, good. When something, when some adversity comes his way, he says, good. No matter what's coming his way, he says, good. And there's a simple shift that happens in your mind. Like when you say, when you stop, when, when you switch from saying things like, I have to go do this versus I get to go do this. There's something that happens in our brain that says, okay, I'm less, I'm less, I'm less kind of concerned about this, or I'm not as nervous, or I'm not resisting this as much as I otherwise would have been. So um, for me, that space between stimulus and response is so critical in every aspect of life. Someone cuts you off on the highway, right? Do I honk on the horn? Do I note all kinds of emotions? Or, okay, whatever. I'm never going to see that person again. Let them go. Not affect them the rest of my day. But what about you, man? How, how, what's, how, do you have any le life lessons that you could share that says that we could learn from? There's one from the, the guy that we were talking about earlier. He, um, he talks about, especially over email and at work, I think is a really great one, is he'll write out the email like, and the response that he wants to say. And obviously make sure that he doesn't have the person's contact in case it gets accidentally sent. And then he sleeps on it. And then he wakes up in the morning. He's like, whoa, he's like, that was stupid. And then just deletes it and writes the correct response. And so it's like, he still gets to process the thing and just be like, and leave it, you know? And I've, I've done that a few times. Hey man, do, do you find your next morning, you have a very different, <laughs> like night and day. I'm like, who the hell wrote this? You know? <laughs> so glad I didn't send that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So yeah, I think that's one. I think it's a really good and and just to realize that like in those environments, understanding like deadlines don't usually like responding to someone straight away to an email that they sent is like they're often not expecting a response to their email straight away. And like feeling the pressure of that and getting caught up in the moment with my emotions. I think it's like realizing that I've got time, you know, and I can just let it and then it dissipates by itself. I think it's been really helpful. Love that. So that's, you know what, whether you realize it or not, your answer is very similar to mine. Stimulus response. However, we treat that time in between. We own that. Totally. Response, man. Exactly. In regards to that challenge piece, do you have a different way of someone challenging up? So let's say you're my direct report and I, I notice something and I, you've said, hey, I really encourage challenge, bringing things up. Let's have this open communication. Do you have any suggestions about how to bring a challenge up? for someone who's you know, below somebody else so that it doesn't come across as, uh, I guess, damaging the risk of damage in the relationship. Yeah. Yeah. There's, if there's ever an example of, uh, time and a place, it's this one because, um, the truth is there are lots of leaders. We should probably call them bosses instead of leaders in this conversation that that's not, that's not a thing. Like they don't want to be challenged. They're not open to other sides. They're not open to different points of view. They don't want their teams to chip in, which is 100% built and born out of insecurity and ego. A hundred percent. And what a shame, because if we want to find the best solutions, if we want members of our team to feel empowered, feel like they're part of a team, um, have an impact that they took the job to actually deliver. I, I, I truly believe every single person who has any type of job in the world is doing it for one and or two things. At certain points of our lives, we have jobs and that is strictly for the money and that's for a step to something else. And then throughout our career or our journey, we end up taking a, a steps in our career, right? We move from a job to something that is more career-based. There's a path, there's an upside. And when we, t when we start that phase of the journey, we do it because we're optimistic. We want to have an impact. We want to leave a mark on the world and make money. So I'm not naive to that. Um, um, so, so for me, what was re what's really important is trying to find that balance between happiness, impact, and money. Um, 
and some bosses are only in it for the money and some bosses are in it for the money and the power, the ability to tell somebody to do something uh, without any fear of, of retribution. So the situational component is such that you, if you, you have to recognize if you're in an organization or more, more specifically have a boss that is open to that type of feedback, how you, how you deliver that feedback is critical. It's like, Hey, Josh, are you, you open to another point of view on this? Instead of just jumping right in with your point of view, it's got to be diplomatic. It's got to be done in a way that doesn't alienate the boss. And when I say time and a place, you certainly don't want to do it in a venue where there are lots of people, right? Probably not the best space to do it in a team meeting or a town hall or something where others are watching because that ego and insecurity in the boss is now being prodded and stoked. And uh, it's probably not going to go well. So I think how we do it is really, really important. But man, at the end of the day, if you feel like you're in a situation where your boss is not open to that, you've tried, you've tried, and it just, it just never works out. I think you got to look in the mirror and decide if this is the place for me. Now, again, not naive. We've got obligations, we've got bills, we've got commitments, we've got to deliver. Um, but you know, I think if we're purposeful about putting ourselves in a position in a role that allows us to be our best selves, which includes challenging up, um, we should, we should work to make plans to find that next step if we're not in that today. And by the way, this is something I struggle with for the first 20 plus years of my career. I had to have all the right answers. I had to be the one that knew everything. I had to be perfect. Um, and that is a foolhardy way to lead because you're leaving the best solutions out there. You have a team for a reason. No one can do, do, do what a team can do alone. Um, um, so, so how we do it's really important to be more specific in my answer to the question. I think you got to read the room, find out. You know, assess is there is there is there a risk that others could hear this and I'm gonna fa I'm gonna sound as if I'm being um, what's the word I'm looking for um, 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 uh, disrespectful I guess would work I need to I need to make sure that my boss hears a genuine suggestion that I'm not just trying to be difficult and have to be right uh, and that was an epiphany for me I don't need to be right anymore I just want to find the right solution now. You mentioned my favorite we. It is we challenge each other. It's my absolute favorite. And I'm quick to say there's a one word sentence behind that we, and it's diplomatically. Um, and, and if you read deeper into the chapter, this chapter of the book, we challenge each other. The challenge must be grounded in one of two things, and perhaps two, data and or experience. So I can't just walk in and say, hey, hey, hey Josh, um, you got to stop wearing those earbuds because they don't, they don't work well. That's my opinion. That's, that's, I have no data or experience to say that. That's just my opinion, or I don't like that blue shirt, you know, whatever. So once you set that kind of threshold as, as to the types of challenges that must be offered, and you know that the we right behind we number eight is we number nine, and that's we embrace challenge. I don't have to embrace your challenge if you're coming at me with your opinion, but I do have to embrace your challenge if you say, hey, man, you know that product launch we're working on? I did the exact same thing at my last company and we took this approach and it failed miserably. I think we should probably consider an alternative route. You must listen to that challenge. It's based in experience. It's grounded in something that actually happened. Otherwise you got these blinders on and you're not, you're not positioned for success if you're just focused on your own solution. Um, so challenges are critical. If you want to get better, if you want to pass mediocre, um, it's the companies and leaders that don't embrace challenge that end up being lapped. They end up being yesterday's news. Uh, the most innovative, brightest, most accomplished, uh, most effective leaders in the world, they are all open to being challenged and they allow their teams to express their dissenting opinions. Um, but as long as I, as, as far as I'm concerned, they must include data or experience to be part of the challenge. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious what you think. It seems like right now um, I deal with a lot of people like all over the world in my job feels like right now, a lot of people are talking about this, insecurity that they have around the economy, interest rates. There's like a general feeling of, of fear that's going on. And I imagine that that's also going to influence someone's desire, I guess, to feel like they're putting their neck out to challenge up or to, you know, step outside of the box. Um, whereas what it sounds like what you're saying is really making sure that's diplomatic as possible, so, which it sounds like is also going to reduce the amount of risk that these, that you have to take while also potentially getting an upside because then the team starts to improve as well. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Look, and in, 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 in my line of work now, I, 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 I give this caveat a lot, and it's, it sounds a little broken record-ish, but I'm not naive. The, the, the principles that I evangelize, the success in my personal and professional life, 
not just mine, dude, thousands of others, including complete strangers now who have read the book, um, they work. But I'm not naive to the fact that not every organization, not every boss is going to embrace that. So we, we all must make a decision, right? Is this an organization that's going to value my input, allow me to be my best me, even if it comes at the expense of being a little confrontational or being um, not argumentative because that's not professional. I'm not, I'm not at all advocating being unprofessional. But we should be comfortable in our role. Look, if we're going to spend thousands of hours, you, you, you know, the average U.S. worker spends more than 100,000 hours in their lifetime working. Second only to sleep. It's the only thing we do more than work is sleep. So if we're going to spend that much time doing something that's not called fun, it's not called vacation, it's not called you know, Disney, uh, we should aspire to make it the most impactful it can be. And if you're in an organization or working with someone that does not allow that, or they discourage it, or you've raised your hand so many times and they just stop calling on you. Uh, I think you have to assess, is there, is there a better way, a more fulfilling way? But the I'm not naive part is the light bill has to be paid, right? We have obligations, you know, we've got childcare, those things. And I don't, you know, if you, if you choose to put your head down and have a less fulfilled work life because of those obligations, good on you. That, that is, that is a decision only you can make. I just happen to know from my own experience and experience of so many others, when you do, when you live a more purposeful life and your career journey is more purposeful, not just waiting for the next paycheck, but waiting for the next point that I can make an impact, that fulfillment's really, really hard to match, man. But it has to come at the right time and the right kind of inflection point for you. Totally, man, I appreciate that. And, and if someone's, let's say I've, you know, I mean, uh, I guess, individual contributor role. And now I've got a few people under me and I'm starting to build a team. Or maybe I've moved into a position that now has a team. Do you have any tips for building trust with those people really quickly? Because it feels like in my experience, what I've noticed is first impressions really matter. And how someone engages with you at the start actually really impacts the rest of that relationship, even if it's like ends up being two years. Um, yeah, do you have any suggestions around that for that, that first impression as they're moving into a new team? Absolutely, because that first step into a quote unquote leadership position, especially if you ascend to now managing or leading the people that were peers to you, is a really, really critical moment of your career. So, you know, if I've got three or four peers and and for whatever reason, by by luck or or whatever, I get promoted and I'm now leading who, the folks that were my peers, there that that could be tougher than even beginning a, a role or starting a role at an organization where you know no one. Uh, actually knowing people that were your peers that now report to you is a very, very difficult thing to navigate. But I have found um, something that I talk a lot about is authenticity plus relatability. So if my team knows I am being myself, like I want to know how your kid's weekend was. I want to know how the soccer game was. You seem a little down today. I want to know if there's something I can do to help that. If I, if I can relate because you know, I, I'm, I'm going through things as well. We all are. We all have baggage. When you can relate to your team members uh, and, and they can see that you're authentically relating, you're not just pandering to them. Authenticity plus relatability equals trust. So when the team realizes that you're not in it for your own accolades, your own success, trying to get your next promotion, you have to genuinely show every single day, by the way, you have to show that you are in this for their growth and their development, which sounds kind of counterintuitive to how a lot of us were raised. You know, I wanted the next title, the next promotion. I wanted the bigger team. I wanted the fancy corner office. I wanted all those things. And, and those could have come at the expense of anybody else's journey. But that's a shame because if you show that you're in it for them, they succeed. And as their leader, it's impossible for you not to be recognized for that success. So my advice is be authentic, be relatable, admit when you don't know something. Uh, nobody wants to follow someone who is a fraud or pretends to know everything because this just in, man. My teams historically have always known my weaknesses without me even telling them. So if I pretend to be something that I'm not, they realize that authenticity is not there. I'm no longer relatable because I'm living a lie. Um, they're not going to trust me. So uh, and, and I'll add this because I found this to be very, very, very important. When you take on a new leadership role, whether it's a new company or you've just ascended into that role, I think it is the, mo the most important uh, activity you can do is align around who we're going to be. What are, what do we, it, doesn't matter if we're, it doesn't matter if we're at a fast food restaurant or if we are in the biggest you know, Fortune 5 company. 
I think the leader's obligation is to gather the team and say, what do we want to be known for? We want to be known for the efficient delivery of our product or service, uh, the quality that we represent with our product or service, the care that we give uh, when we deliver our product or service. You know, you pick it. What do we want to be known for? And then establish principles that enable that. So for me, I wanted the team to know very, very clearly, these are the 10 things that, that are, they will define how we treat one another. I care, le- believe it or not, I care less about wowing a customer than I care about wowing my team. Because if my team is wowed and we're high functioning behind the curtains, it's almost impossible to fail externally. The, f- the opposite is true as well. If we're hella dysfunctional behind the scenes, the odds of us delivering a great product or service to those we serve externally, our clients, uh, I think they're compromised. So I, I think setting expectations, here's who we are, evangelizing those principles every single day, um, almost to the point where it feels a little corny, but where a lot of organizations and companies fail is they hire someone into a role. They tell them the basics of the job. Here's what you need to do, you know, to, to keep your job, your success criteria, your KPIs or whatever, but they don't say how they don't say, here's how we expect you to interact with Jane down the hall. Here's how we expect you to work with me as your leader. Like challenge me if I give you a direction that doesn't make sense. So, so I think you got to be authentic and relatable if you want to add trust. And I think you've got to establish expectations early, not like how many widgets must be processed, but like we do the right thing. We lead by example. We say what we're going to do, you know, like the 10 we's, those principles define who we are. And when someone behaves in a way that's contrary to that, it's now much easier to call them out for it because we talked about this on day one of my, of my, of my tenure. Yeah. Wow. I mean, I really appreciate that. Like, and you're saying also, does this go for when it's just you and let's say three other people, you know, like you're, your team, you're a part of a bigger team, but then you have your smaller team of one, two, three, you suggest bringing that to them in the exact same way. Man, I, 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 I would encourage no direct reports. If, if you have no direct reports, you can still live and operate in a very principled way that others will recognize. They will, uh, you'll create a magnetism. Um, and, and I get kind of uh, wound up when I talk to um, leaders that have, you know, a handful of direct reports or maybe two, and they feel like they don't have a huge impact in the overall organization. Well, um, neither did Elon Musk before, or, or let me give a better example. Jeff Bezos had no impact on the world when he was selling books out of the back of his car, out of this tiny office. You earn the right to have a bigger impact. So if you've got a team with two or three direct reports, make that team of two or three be the most recognized, the, the, the best quality, the highest functioning. The, we have each other's back more than anyone else. And you'll see this magnetism where others will want to be a part of that team. They'll want to leave their role in their other, on the other team or another company because they hear and they see what you're doing. So don't, don't confuse like scale with your ability to still have an impact. Um, you know, one of my principles is we lead by example. And I think that's often confused or made out to be something more grand than it is. You know, it doesn't mean the shiniest shoes or, you know, an MBA from some Ivy league, uh, university it doesn't mean those things. It means behaving in a way that you would want others to replicate something. If it were blast in the company newsletter or even worse, all over the internet, are you proud of the way you, that you behave? That's leading by example. As I walk through the halls, if we're on-prem, if I walk through the halls and I'm, and I'm and my face is buried in my phone as a colleague walks my way, that's not leading by example. I've just told them whatever's going on in my phone is more important than you. And there's ne- that's never the case. It's never the case that a colleague or a team member of mine is less important than an email that I can wait to reply to at some other time. I've got to put that down. I've got to look up and say, what's up, man? How's your day going? How was your weekend? Right? Because I'm now leading it by an example that that person is much more likely to say, hello, man, how's it going to the next person that crosses their path? So you, you create these behaviors that others see, they replicate it, and that's something to be proud of. Um, uh, if you'll give me one second, my favorite story for leading by example, it's, it sounds so trivial and silly. There was a, a an office I used to go to uh, back in the late, uh, I guess it was around 2018, 2019, I would go to it was a thousand, roughly a thousand people in this, in this facility. And for whatever reason, there were, there were a limited number of restrooms. So a thousand people, you would expect lots of restrooms, not the case in this building. You're like, where is he going with this? Um, I would visit this location, go to the restroom, 
and invariably there would be many other fellows in there. And every time I would finish, I would go over to the, to the wash basin and wash my hands, dry my hands off. And, and I noticed in this one bathroom, almost every time I was in there, there was three quarters to maybe even an inch of standing water on that sink on the countertop. Right. And I would go in, wash my hands, dry off, throw it, be a guy next to me, washing his hands, dry off, throw it. But nobody did anything about this water. Right. So I was the leader of this organization. This was one of 11 locations, had about a thousand people. I certainly could have called and said, man, get this cleaned up, get, increase janitorial staff. I get, but it occurred to me every time I'm in there, they see this guy who's only here once a month or whatever. Here's the big boss. And he sees our working condition and he's not doing anything to fix it. So I didn't realize, but I was sending the message that I, this kind of thing doesn't matter to me. Your work environment's not that important. So what did I do, Josh? One day, without a whole lot of thought, guy next to me, wash, instead of throwing my paper towels in, in, into the trash, I take them and I start wiping down the counter. Threw them away, didn't say a word, walked out. Every time thereafter that I was in that restroom, I would do that. And almost every time there would be someone there standing next to me and they watched this go down. They didn't say anything, I didn't say anything. Wouldn't you know, over, a course, over the course of the next several, probably months, I don't think it was weeks, but months, I would go back into this location hit that restroom and the counter was dry. I never said a word, didn't encourage anybody else to do it, but they saw me do it. I assume there's no proof to this, but I assume they saw me doing it and started to take care of it themselves. That's leading by example. doesn't have to be some grand gesture. That's leading by example. Um, I, I still, I go back to the comment I made earlier, man. I think ego is, is, a, it's a four letter word, uh, in this context and, and many leaders of all seniority of all kind of title of all industries, um, they allow insecurity and this ego thing to, to allow them to think that they are always right. Um, and when we ascend to a, a leadership or a quote unquote management position, um, we are often not taught, you know, fundamental leadership 101 type things. We know the, the competencies required to be successful at the job. We know what our boss expects of us, but very rarely does an organization say, here's how, like, here is the leadership 101 that we need you to, uh, to, to subscribe. So I think we, we, we feel as if title or rank gives us like some type of omniscience, we have we have a, a omniscience. We have the we have license to all the greatest ideas, and that's just simply not true. Um, it all not only does it alienate your teams when when you feel like you have and behave like you have to be right, it sends the message to them that their input is not valued, um, and, and that's just a terrible place for everyone to be. So I would say um, talk less, listen more, um, even when you know the answer and you feel like you've got the path to the solution that we're kind of discussing in a, in a meeting. What do you think, Josh, you, you know, allow others to weigh in. If you get to the same solution that you happen to know is the right answer, but someone else is responsible for teeing up that solution, what goodwill have you created? And the next time we're, we're wrestling with something, I don't have the answer. I know I've got a team that is comfortable saying what they want to say. So I think, I think, um, you know, setting our principles, evangelizing them with our teams, living them conspicuously every day and allowing them to be their best, which includes offering their opinions um, as long as it's grounded in data or experience and allowing them to play a role in the team's journey. Um, you, you know, when you get into that leadership role, it's not a dictatorship. You, you can find success leading that way. I do think it's a finite window before people start to get alienated and they leave you because they know you're in it for you. But I think making an overt effort to allow the team know that you're there for them uh, and you prove it every day is, is where to go. The pitfall is just acting like you, you know it all, have it all, and, and can't be bothered with others. Yeah, yeah, it's so funny. Like I'm, I'm smiling so much as you're talking because I find I've found that in the past. I feel like I've gotten a lot better at it. 
because I sucked so hard at it was shutting the fuck up and just being like, and letting other people talk and just being, and just not even being conscious of it, you know, and having been in environments, I became conscious of it in myself because I was, I was in other leadership environments with people who were not conscious and they're running an entire company, like thousands of people. And they're just like just steamrolling over any idea or any suggestion that someone else had. And they're not even, they're not being a dick. That's just, they're just so unconscious. It's who they are. Yeah. And it's worked for them, right? It's worked for them in a lot of cases. But then, and then the, the attrition that we had was atrocious. Imagine that, right? Yeah. Surprise. <laughs> surprise. Yeah. That's a key metric to watch when you, when you have bad leadership is people just don't want to be there anymore. They don't. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, what's been a really, I'd love to, you know, if we can just open up a little bit and what do you think has been one of the toughest times as a leader and, and maybe some mistakes that you've made that, that really impacted you to make a right turn, you know, and maybe you didn't realize you were being in conscious, unconscious. Yeah. Yeah. Um, wh one, one scenario comes to mind. Um, I'm a, I'm a lucky guy in a lot of ways, man. When any time and not every time, but most times when I have made a decision to take on a challenge, whether it be put myself out there for a new role or um, throw my name up for some type of volunteer activity inside the organization um, that I was with, I've, I've, I've usually landed on my feet and, and kind of delivered. Um, but one scenario comes to mind. So I was leading a group of about, I would say it's probably 4,000 people. This is back in 20, 2010, 2011. And the, the gentleman to whom I reported at the time left to take on another role. So my boss's position was now open and, and, and I felt like I was a shoe in for that role. Um, in the interim, but until that position was filled, I was reporting to the president of the division who I had a decent relationship with. And I learned not from him, but indirectly that we had opened that position to the public. We were accepting resumes and interviews had even started. And then I learned that um, I was not going to even be given an interview. So I was hot. Um, you know, it's kind of the natural reaction. I felt like I had earned that. And a uh, new gentleman was hired. I have a new boss. And I, but I still had occasional one-on-ones with the president, the business unit. This guy's name's Ted Carpenter. Brilliant man. Um, have nothing but good things to say about him. And the fact that I'm telling the story, I think, shares my affection for him. Uh, he hired someone else and I had an, an, a one-on-one -on -one with Ted and I was like, you know, I got to ask you, man, why, why wasn't I considered for, for this role? Why, why did you not like, why didn't we even talk about it? And he said, Kyle, when William left my old boss, when he left, we asked you to pick up a few extra, a few extra barrels. We asked, we asked you to take on a little more than your job description required. And uh, it didn't go well. Admittedly, it didn't go well. The results were not as great as they could have been because I had taken on a new functional area that I really had no intimacy with, didn't know how it operated, but I, I know people. So I felt like I could still, and we didn't fall off a cliff. It just wasn't, we weren't excelling. And he said, Kyle, when we gave you this extra responsibility, you never raised your hand and asked for help. And I thought to myself, this is a younger Kyle that is, you know, probably pretty ego driven. I was like, well, of course I didn't ask for help, man. I want to say 30. Uh, maybe 30, early 30s, 32, 33. Um, you never asked for help. And I my, my reaction, I didn't say, I didn't vo voice it because I was a different guy then and I just kind of swallowed it. But I was like, ask for help. I'm like, dude, you gave me this responsibility. It's my job to figure it out. I, 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 I own the results, but ask for help. What a mistake. So the life lesson there for me was when, when the waters are rough, you're facing challenges, especially unfamiliar challenges, you got to raise your hand. You got to ask for help. But that help probably first comes in the form of people on the team. People that know way more about the shit you're now managing than I did the day before. Like they, a lot of these guys and gals came up in that functional area. They knew the work way better than me. My ego stood in the way of saying, Ted, thanks for giving me this extra responsibility. I didn't realize it as a trial at the time, but it turned out it kind of was. I should have said for me to be successful in here, here's what I need. I didn't do that. So that's a lesson for me that I think is probably appropriate in, in, in kind of uh, a real life example for others in that we don't have to have all the answers. We don't have to be right. We have to find the answers. We have to find what's right, not be right. 
but my ego didn't let me do that. So I think that's, that was something that I learned a long, long time ago that you don't have to know it all and lean on those around you that do know it. And that's something I've taken with me to this day when I'm trying to solve problems in my business. Um, uh, I've got another business that I'd spend a little bit of time in, uh, probably half my time in when we're in a, when we're in a, uh, we're in a foxhole trying to solve a problem, even if it's something with which I'm very familiar. Uh, I, I say, what do we do here, guys? Any thoughts? What, what do we do? And allow that to marinate instead of me just jump. You got to ask for help is the long story short, Josh. Thankful. Yeah, man. Thankful. Because if, if uh, you're asking if someone on my team comes to me for help, dude, I, I, I boil it down to this. I think the leader's job is twofold. That's it. The leader has two obligations. And the first is to remove the barriers that stand in the way of your team being excellent. So that could be, you know, maybe, maybe a member of the team has a childcare issue and they're trying to navigate that, but they don't want their work to suffer. Can we find a solution? Can I allow her to be a hybrid worker for, you know, a, a, a finite period of time? Or someone wants to get really good at, you know, you pick the platform, whether they want to be a PowerPoint czar or some type, they want to get better at something. That stands in the way of their path to excellence. It's my job to help them get better at that, remove the barriers, right? So I could find them a class. I could find them someone else on the team, but I need to focus on whatever it takes to get those barriers out of the way. That's job one. And then job two is inspire the team for excellence to achieve excellence in spite of the things I can't remove because the leader's never going to pull all the noise out of the system. You're never going to remove all the external th threats. There's always going to be something it's called work. It's not called fun, but if I can focus maniacally almost on getting that noise out of their way to allow them to be really focused on the job at hand, I think the results come and I think they're going to find success and find fulfillment along the way. If I can't, the things that I can't get out, I got to be honest about it and say, Josh, man, I really wish we could get the president to the president of the company to lower our target this year or, or whatever the thing is, right? Be open about it. Can't get that, man. This is what we're facing. Yeah. Our client wasn't fair. For example, we got a, we've got a, a performance review from our client. We don't think it's fair at all. Okay. Like Jocko says, good. Let's go be great in spite of that. So I think if you show that you care enough to get all the obstacles out of the way, the team is much more reaction, uh, uh, responsive rather, to the, the, the threats that remain because they know their boss has tried like hell to get them out of the way. Man, it feels a lot of trust as well, you know, if they feel that comfortability. Huge, huge. Um, I'd love to get some thoughts because we mentioned um, quite a few times like being in person in an office, you know, actually physically being in front of people. Whereas now, like I work for an Australian company as an example, I live in Medellin, Colombia, and I sell and we have clients literally all over the world, like UK, US, I'm dealing with three different time zones. <laughs> like the, the re but that the reality of that is that my entire interaction with my team has been completely digital for the last year, I haven't seen one person in person. Um, and so do you have any advice for guys who are in these environments coming in and, you know, maybe coming in? I haven't met a single person in person. Like I said, you know, how would you navigate that differently than what you might have, you know, 10 years ago when everything was in office? Yeah, brother, I think it's situational like everything else. So let me toss it back to you. Like, what do you need? So you took the role, the job that you're in today, you know, the level of uh, in-person interaction that you're going to have. Um, does that work for you? Is it something that you regret having that flexibility and freedom? Like, what is your reaction to your scenario? It's it's just been very, I guess, it's made me focus more on things like your book and how do I make the most amount of impact in less time? And then being really conscious of how we log in and log off to meetings. And there's no walk into an office, have a meeting and then walk out and hang out and maybe go back to your cubicles and whatever and build relationships. And having to be really conscious of setting aside the time to have a connection with the people that I'm working with, you know, especially my team, you know, my direct reports. But those sound all like tremendous advantages of your work situation, right? You would not be as purposeful about reading how to 
connect to people. You wouldn't be as purposeful are you, as you are about connecting with people, uh, you know, virtually. Um, so I think the the plus side is is phenomenal in your case. But I asked you that question as an example because there are people who are probably on your team or or similar roles that love this remote uh, environment, but then there are others that have lost the connection and they feel like it's not for them. You know, I think the, a lot of the data and studies show today, the hybrid environment is probably the most uh, effective and efficient, but I'm, 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 I'm not waffling on the question. The reason I'm kind of picking both sides of this is it's situational and like anything else in life, you can make it what you want it to be. It allows you probably some work-life balance that you may not otherwise get if you're working, you know, you got to sit in a car an hour on the way to the office, an hour on the way back. Like you've lost two hours out of your day. You're grumpy when you get home. You have to get up earlier, maybe a compromise your workout. So there are, there are trade-offs, right? That happen when, when the flip side for you is you, you know, you're, you're more purposeful about how to, how to manage those relationships and cultivate, you know, genuine, authentic relationships. So it's different for every single person. So how I like to manage it is individually. So if I have a member of the team who, and this doesn't just go for the work at home versus versus on premise, it's like anything. Some people don't want to be recognized publicly if they do a great job. Those people, a handwritten note's wonderful. That 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 tells them the boss has seen it. He he recognizes or she recognizes my contribution, and they're grateful for me. Uh, you know, work at home very similar. What works for you might not work for someone else, but I think it's the leader's obligation to put that environment in place that they can be their best regardless of where. Um, look, man, the, the the work, the relationship between company and employee is wildly different than it was multiple years ago, if not even just a handful of years ago, certainly since since COVID. And here's what I mean by that. Historically, uh, the firm, the, the the employer sets the table for behavior, who we who we hire, how they dress, how they speak, how they interact and behave inside of the organization, essentially filtering who the employee is really because they want them to subscribe and kind of behave in this cookie cutter way that our organization was built and has grown on, right? Those days are over because there are more options than ever before. Can you imagine living like 20 years ago, if you met someone who says, yeah, I live in Colombia, but my company is based in Australia and I deal with people around the world. That is unheard of. It was, was unheard of. Here's my point. There are so many options for the workforce today. Uh, different avenues, jobs that didn't even exist a number of years ago. And that is why I think it's more incumbent on, instead of the organization forcing people to conform to their ways, the, the employee now has a lot to say with where they take their talents, where they spend their 100,000 hours, and it allows, in, in a scenario that allows them to be their best. So it's a long-winded way of saying, uh, when I lead or how I lead is really situational to each person, depending on what motivates and inspires them to be their best. What motivates and inspires one could be wildly different than another. Same is true for work at home versus, uh, versus brick and mortar. And if you're, if you, you know, you've got your finger on the pulse with kind of where the world's at and what's happened over the last few years, like let's imagine you've got a younger brother right now, 27 to kind of 32. Like, what do you think he needs to hear right now? I think he needs to hear there's a lot of mediocrity in the world today and there's a lot of acceptance of mediocrity and I'm not saying that's wrong, but if you want to have an impact, if you want to be remembered for being just a good person, not necessarily someone that changed the world in some kind of quantified way, if you want to have an impact and you want to have um, a legacy uh, for which you can be proud that your parents might be proud of when, you know, when they're looking down from wherever they are at some point, do not accept mediocrity. I say loathe mediocrity actually. And, um, you know, someone, um, I saw a clip recently and someone asked, uh, Barack Obama, what's the key to success inside the workplace? And I may have the question wrong, but I recall this response more than the question. It was just figure out how to fix shit, figure out how to get shit done. And I think that's, you know, right. I think that's so important. By the way, it's one of the principles as we take action is recognizing where there's an opportunity to solve something, provide a solution, uh, fix something, get something done, move something along its path. Those are the people that the world recognizes as impactful. Um, you solve a problem that maybe some people didn't even know they had. Um, attack life, man. Attack life. Be, be better every single day. I'm not trying to be some woo-woo inspirational guy when I say that, 
because I don't do it every day. There are days I put my head down. I'm like, what the fuck did I accomplish today? But that's the journey, dude. That's life. So um, I would say loathe mediocrity. I'll pair it back um, our former president and say, try to find a way to get stuff done because that's how you get recognized for being more than just mediocre. And attack life, man. Every day is a gift. Every single day is a gift. And there are people in this world who would trade their roles with you, trade spots with you in a blink of an eye. I think there's something like 2 billion people on the planet that don't even have running water. What do I have to complain about? So chase it, go get it, be better than you were yesterday. And when you're not, give yourself a little latitude and be better the next day. It, let's, let's say like you're with that younger brother. They've had that day where the day before they're like, what the fuck am I doing? Like I've achieved nothing. And it's the next day. So let's say it's Monday, sucked a bag of dicks. Tuesday, I'm ready to rock and roll. How would you get them ready to rock and roll and start again, like start fresh? Would it be with exercise in the morning? Like what's your, how do you get back on the rhythm when you've fallen off the tracks? I love, I love that question. Um, number one is the bag of dicks that I was exposed to on Monday. Is that going to matter a month from now? Probably not. The things that we get so bent out of shape over someone cuts you off on the highway or your boss speaks to you in a way that's, you know, kind of not so endearing. Like, is that shit going to matter a month from now? 99 out of a hundred times, the answer is no. So let's put it in perspective, right? This, this failure, this setback, this bad day that I've had, this is not permanent. There are people who would love to have my bad day today. So get over it, move on. Tomorrow's a new day, the sun comes up. And you said something that I am really a fan of and subscribe to, physical activity. Just, there's, there, there, it's proven, right? When you release these endorphins, when you, when you strain your body, when you accomplish things physically, you are, in a way, hardwiring your brain to accept challenge. You're hardwiring almost your life to make that as a part of who you are, right? Overcoming challenges that come with physical activity. If you're not capable of physical activity or it's not something you've done forever, get on a treadmill. I, I, I'm, man, I'm telling you not to overshare. I'm struggling. I have a very bad back right now. I'm delaying back surgery as long as I can. My cardio this morning was an hour at 3.5 on a treadmill. That's it. But that stimulation that I know is going to come from that, I get a decent sweat going. That is, that is how I start my day. It's what I did right before this podcast, which I think brings an energy to me that allows me to be my best. So put that thing, that bad, that bad, whatever it was that happened, the bag of dicks, put it aside. It, you know, it may happen again, how you react to it's up to you. And if it does happen again, by the way, you're now more experienced. You understand what to do with that bag when you see it. Uh, and then you ask for something more tactical, get active, get that heart rate going, get a sweat going. And I think that is transformational, especially if you do it, you know, over time with some, with some consistency. Bam, get a sweat. I love that, man. I think that's a good place to end. Get a sweat. That's all. It's not hard. Thanks, Kyle. That was epic. The pleasure is mine. Thank you, Josh. Keep doing the work, man. Appreciate you. Thanks, brother. <laughs> that was legendary. I'm so glad you ran with the bag of dicks.